Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome dear participants to today's module. In the previous modules, we had looked at the foundational development of the concept of gender and how the early feminist movement intersects with gender theory. In today's module, we will introduce the philosophy of Simone de Beauvoir and her understanding of gender, even though she herself has not used the word gender per se. Yet no discussion of gender theories can ever be complete without incorporating her ideas. This module begins with a discussion of some of the key ideas of Bua in order to emphasize on the distinctiveness of her contribution to the theories of gender and also to prepare the philosophical ground for our study of the second sex in the next module. D. Bergofen has commented that she is a belatedly acknowledged philosopher and there are several reasons for it. She had identified herself as an author rather than as a philosopher and jokingly called herself the midwife of Sartre's existential ethics rather than a thinker in her own right. However, her place in philosophy had to be won against her words, but this place is now uncontested. Since its publication in 1949 in France, Bois' second sex has continued to shape debates and discussions around gender. Key feminist thinkers of recent decades such as Lucy Irigere and Judith Butler have acknowledged their intellectual debt to Bois' work. Karin Wynne Jesse rightly comments that Boas' philosophy already encompasses all the elements of contemporary feminism, so much so that it can be taken as its paradigm. The extent and equity of her insight is profoundly felt in all aspects of gender criticism today. Bua had been influenced by the neo-Hegelian revival led by Kojivi and Jia Hippolyte in the 1930s. Reading Hegel in German during the war years, she produced an original critique of his dialectic of consciousness. Its impact can be felt in several aspects of her philosophy. Some other influences which have shaped her understanding of issues are Kierkegaard, Edmund Husserl, Heidegger, Jia Pal Sartre. Bua developed her own existential phenomenology, which was inspired by Heidegger, Husserl and Sartre and combined with a philosophy of history inspired by Hegel, Kojiv and Karl Marx. Bua had taken the historical and existential interpretation of the master-slave dialectic from her readings of Hegel. From Kierkegaard, she had retained the notion of the existing individual in pursuit of an authentic ethical life, but had transposed it to a secular context. She was also influenced by Husserl's focus on consciousness's lived experience of the life world of perception and praxis, by Heidegger's notion of the human subject as being the seen, mid seen and as being towards death, also informed her ethics and account of gendered subjectivity in the second sex. She had worked with Sartre in the same existential philosophical context in the 1940s. However, her focus was primarily ethical rather than ontological. 
Bua and Sartre, the two philosophers who are often cited simultaneously in similar contexts, had first met in October 1929 when they were in their early 20s. They had an open relationship and were a powerful couple. They also always read each other's work and debate continues about the extent to which they influenced each other in their existentialist work, such as Sartre's being in nothingness and Boas she came to stay in phenomenology and intent. As Boas had suggested, they had a comradeship which had welded their lives together and it made a superfluous mockery of any other bond they might have forged for themselves. Louis Menand has repented that they had independent lives. They met in cafes, entertained people on separate tables, but also maintained a kind of soul marriage which continued for 50 years. Their letters and diary entries suggest that when either of them developed romantic inclination for any other partner, they both felt cheated and angry. Now we shall play a rare clip from a 1967 documentary. It was filmed at Sartre's Monte Prince high rise apartment overlooking the cemetery where the two philosophers were eventually buried. Dès qu'on dit Sartre, on dit aussi Simone de Beauvoir, le castor pour ses amis. Depuis 36 ans, les deux écrivains se voient tous les jours. Ils sont un couple, couple intimement lié et à la fois très libre. Pour préserver leur intimité, mais surtout parce qu'ils se sont voués au travail, ils ont instauré dans leur vie une organisation de verre. Tous les matins, chacun travaille seul de son côté. Let us discuss some of the key terms that Bua has used throughout her literary works. First, we shall look at her concept of situation and facticity. This concept is important to understand as in the later weeks when we will discuss Judith Butler in detail, we will find that she has also explored Bua's understanding of body as situation in gender trouble. Butler addresses Bua's use of the word situation to describe the body's status and social position. In Bua's thought, situation refers to how a human being as an individual consciousness is engaged in the world with regard to other people, to time, to his space and to other products of his or her facticity. Facticity refers to the necessary connection between consciousness and the world of inert matter in the past. So, what are the aspects of my facticity? Aspects of my situation which I have not chosen, for example, the facts of my birth, my body, the existence of other people in my life, my death and that I cannot choose not to accept as part of my situation. Toril Mui, the feminist theorist has explained that the concept of situation has enabled Bua to avoid having to divide lived experience up into the traditional subject-object binary. Precisely because the other, for instance, is an example of my facticity, is always already part of that situation. Bua's notion of the body as a situation is, as Toril Mai has commented, a crucially original and often overlooked contribution to feminist theory. Unlike Sartre, her focus is predominantly ethical rather than ontological as she sets out to examine the importance of situation. Along with her concept of situation and facticity, Bua's work explores the concept of reciprocity. As existing alone is impossible and also undesirable as far as pursuing our projects are concerned, 
Bua asks what we can expect from other people who are indisputably in the world with us. She explores various modes of relating to other people such as self-sacrifice and ways in which individuals act for each other. She cites the example of the slave who obeys the master and the woman who sacrifices her life to her husband. In Hegelian terms, it is the end to the antithesis of subject and object. An important feature of self-other relations, reciprocity is a relationship of mutual equality, one that allows for true reciprocity and mutual subjectivity. The importance that Bua has attributed to this moment of Hegelian recognition in the master-slave dialectic suggests that she emphasizes the potential for reciprocity in the relation to the other. However, it is crucial to note here that she does not adopt the voluntaristic notion of freedom of Sartre's being and nothingness which he had published in 1943 and which depends on a will to be free effectively arguing that our actions are the products of free choices. In a state, Bua distinguishes between one's freedom and one's relative capacity to act in a given context. Bua's existential beliefs are key to understand her philosophical approach, a particular concept which is essential to decode her philosophy of woman is her notion of ambiguity. In the Ethics of Ambiguity, which was published in 1947, Bua begins her discussion by arguing that the human condition is ambiguous, by which she means that the meaning of human existence is not fixed, but must be constantly created within the parameters of seemingly opposed conditions of existence. Human existence is ambiguous because Human beings are both free and unfree, separate and connected to each other, a subject for ourselves and an object for others, consciousness and body, alive yet born to die. The ethics of ambiguity reconsiders the idea of invulnerable freedom, which had been initially presented by Bua in her first philosophical essay with the title of Pyrrhus and Sinias. Bua drops a distinction between the inner and outer domains of freedom and deploys a unique understanding of consciousness as an intentional activity. It is also relational. The concept of ambiguity, which has originated in Bua's moral philosophy, is later on connected to the female body and feminine desire along with its ethical connotations in the second sex. A fundamental aspect of ambiguity of human condition is the fact that human beings are simultaneously separate and interdependent. Each one depends upon others and this is referred to as human interdependence. For Bua, the other is not a hindrance to my freedom, so to say, but a condition for my freedom to be realized. To her, the me-others relationship is as binding as the subject-object relationship. The concept of ambiguity is applied not only to the female body, but also to the feminine desire in her seminal work, The Second Sex. Bua does not view the body as something dominated by and subordinate to consciousness. She maintains that the body is a situation and the human being a historical idea. Thus, that the biological nature of humans is never experienced apart from a second social nature. So, body as well as body consciousness is always historically mediated. Differences between the sexes are also dependent on historical situations. However, a woman has a special relationship to her body. For instance, when she is pregnant, she is herself, she still also experiences herself as alienated, as the species has taken hold of her, her body is something other than herself. There are thus differences between the sexuality of men and women, 
but she assumes nevertheless that intersubjectivity in heterosexual love is possible. In Bois' opinion, a woman embodies the ambiguity of the human condition more explicitly than the man. Being separate as well as interdependent body as well as consciousness and it also applies to the notion of feminine desire. Boer has rejected Sartre's view which was presented in being and nothingness of human beings as autonomous separate subjects with instrumental and conflictual relationship to each other. Rather, she does not repeat Sartre's dualistic image of the consciousness body relationship, but replaces it with a notion of a fundamental ambiguity that is of human beings as at once separate and interdependent. I would refer to Eva Gothlin here, who in her essay also finds certain commonalities between Bua's concept of ambiguity and Irigere's analysis of differences between the sexes in relation to the body and sexuality. Irigeri has illustrated these ideas in her work, This Sex Which Is Not Done and An Ethics of Sexual Difference. Combining the notions of ambiguity with femininity, Bua takes up a position which opposes essentialism. Ambiguity connected to women is positive for Bua. As woman is more complicated and ambiguous than man, she is closer to Bua's conception of human nature. Carrying forward her idea of the ambiguity of human existence, Bua also suggests that intersubjective experiences depend on the collective meaning created with others. Unlike Saad's conception of freedom, Bua recognized that each individual is in a unique situation which limits and also defines possibilities of resisting oppression. Bua points out that Sartre's understanding of bad faith is in fact biased. She notices that the subject that Sartre is mentioning is not genderless but is an erotic subject. As a result, the situated and cultured perceptions of the subjects are diverse due to different social conditioning. Bua's arguments at this point are closer to those of Michel Foucault and Judith Butler. We can refer to Butler's argument that all desire is culturally constructed. Philosophical understandings of Bua are reflected in her critical as well as creative writings. I would refer to her short essay, Bridget Bardot and the Lolita Syndrome and later on to a novel, she came to his stay to elucidate it further. The essay was published in 1959, 10 years after the second sex and is taken as a continuation of her arguments. It deals with the concept of the eternal feminine as a socio-cultural embodiment of gender inequality in the form of sexually ideologized and ideologizing discourse about women and sexual difference. A component of gender essentialism, drawing on her work on myth from the second sex, Boa argues that the famous French actress Brigitte Bardot constitutes literally a new embodiment of the old myth of the eternal feminine. Bois essay consists of 37 pages and 70 photographs and centers on the French actress Brigitte Bardot and the creation of her persona by her husband and film director Roger Vadim, whom she had married when she was 18 years old. Vadim had directed the famous film And God Created Woman in 1954, in which Bardot represented the modern version of the traditional myth of all that is and will always be feminine. And besides as a continuation of the study of myths in the second sex, Bua considers in this essay that Bardot replaces the model of the femme fatale by that of the child woman. The eternal feminine is foremost that body of myth which speaks of woman as other. It represents a collective imaginary relation to woman and common heritage. Its images and discourse call up heavily coded and generally agreed upon 
sets of presuppositions concerning women and male female relationships in this essay bua poses the question of representation of the meaning of the resurgence of the child woman who is triumphing not only in the movies but in the theater and especially notoriously so in fictional works like nobuko's lolita traces of the second sex are conspicuous in the essay commenting that the director of the film had launched a new type of eroticism by projecting the sexual carefree image on the silver screen bua explores the disruptive erotic power of burdot as a combination of femme fatale and the nymphette in the article titled bua on burdot the ambiguity syndrome dennis warren has suggested that for bua the eternal feminine is a discursive structure which refers to and encompasses the culture's collective and particular myths about women bua views it as an anaphorization a rhetorical figure of speech which alludes to a known implied and legitimized totalization which is not specifically articulated and need not be so what are the examples of anaphors you know how women are oh that's just like a woman and these are the examples everyone understands the implications of these statements in the context in which they have been uttered the anaphor creates a common space and a complicity in an agreed upon knowledge in which everyone participates even though many of them may not know much about it it is with a sense of irony that bua looks at the revival of the child woman as a remedy to a flagging male eroticism in response to increased gender equality she comments in the essay that an adult woman inhabits the same world as the man she takes up all the responsibilities which a man of her age group shoulders for example she can drive she can go to the office she can earn money she can trade in shares but the child woman moved in a universe which the adult man could not enter the age difference reestablishes between them the distance that seems necessary to desire although burdot's possibilities of genuine sexual autonomy in post war french cinema are contested by more recent feminist film critics bua was correct to identify her subversive erotic power even if it is a power contained and manipulated by the patriarchal gaze both on and off screen the eternal feminine is at the heart of women's ontological dilemma all aspects of the myth of femme fatale whether positive or negative exclude her from the society of man and define her as outsider to the masculine norm to refuse its terms is to go against the collective sexual imperative similarly to choose relegates women to otherness in both ethics of ambiguity and her essay on burdot bua introduces and reinforces her key concepts such as the other ambiguity situation and myth these concepts were developed within the context of gender relations in the second sex Let us now briefly look at Bua's first novel. She had close relationship with Sartre. Traditionally, Sartre scholars have tended to treat Simone de Bua only as an eyewitness to the life of her men. But Bua wrote most of all of her first novel she came to stay before Sartre had even begun to write Being in Nothingness and many of the philosophical ideas credited as originating with being in nothingness did not appear in sartre's journals and other writings until after he had read the second draft of she came to stay the novel which was published in 1943 marks the beginning of critical engagement with hegel's phenomenology of spirit that reappears in bua's two major philosophical writings Firstly the ethics of ambiguity 
published in 1947 and The Second Sex published in 1949. Bois first published novel is a fictionalized account of a triangular relationship indicating the one between Bua, Harsel, Sartre and Olga Kosakiewicz. Dealing with a concrete threat posed by a third party, the problem of the other in existentialist terms to an established heterosexual relationship, Bua's novel is a dense evocation of sexual and moral dilemmas in existentialist Paris. On this slide, I have summed up the plot of the novel. As we can note, the novel is an excellent illustration of concepts and themes associated with existential phenomenology. Marley Ponty has termed it as a philosophical novel. He says that the task of literature and philosophy can no longer be separated and asserts that Boas She Came to His Day signifies the development of a metaphysical literature and the end of a moral literature. Iris Murdoch, the famous British philosopher and writer, has interpreted Marley Ponty's assertion as a recognition that in an existentialist novel, the interest is focused upon the ambiguity of the character's situation and upon how the characters choose to resolve this. This novel is a mediation on the Hegelian problem of the existence of the other and plays out the psychological effects of jealousy and questions the extent to which coexistence is possible. Critics like Hazel Barnes and Escher have noted that close ties between Bua's first novel and Sartre's Being and Nothingness published in the same year are significant. Both texts deal with the central existentialist theme of letting others absorb one's freedom. Bua cites the epigraph from Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit here, each consciousness pursues the death of the other. Bua has identified three fundamental procedures or attitudes that one may take up regarding the subjectivity or consciousness of the other. Persons may seek to experience themselves as the other's object. They may seek to guard their subjectivity by making the other their object and they may seek a reciprocity with the other whereby each treats the other as both subject and object, as equal freedoms and sources of value. Most scholars identify the dialectic of Lord and Bondsman and Alexander Kojewe's interpretation of this dialectic as a formative for Bua, that is, as the basis for the model of intersubjective reciprocity that informs both her ethical and feminist writings. For Bua, the struggle between master and slave, man and woman, is crucially a historical one and hence subject to change. In this way, her notion of quote unquote becoming woman draws on the Hegelian notion of subjectivity as dialectical, a subject in process. She emphasizes, like Kojiv, the possibility of reciprocal recognition between master and slave, man and woman, as a solution to the struggle for recognition which is fundamental to and recurrent in history. For Bua, as for Hegel, Self-consciousness is a result of the self-other relation. In other words, we need other people to become ourselves. Bua's novels are grounded in her training as a philosopher and also in her sociological and feminist concerns. Novels like She Came to Stay, The Blood of Others, All Men Are Mortal and The Mandarins revolve around the questions of freedom and responsibility and try to define the proper relationship between the individual and society. Her characters search for authenticity as they attempt to shape the world around them. Without any doubt, she is a feminist thinker for the 21st century. Her concept of the self is relevant and influential in the light of the postmodern critique of the essential unitary self and also of the multiculturalist critique of the autonomous self. I will now briefly refer to some aspects of Bua's thinking which in my opinion are relevant in the context of many current philosophical debates. An outline of our interpretation of Bua 
in relation to contemporary feminism, especially in relation to its logic of equality and difference and to its themes of identity and diversity. We will conclude with how Boas thinking gives us important clues as to how to solve some of the apparent dilemmas of contemporary feminism and how to conceive of a feminism or a gender conceptualization for the 21st century. Boas perspective about the situation of women provoked much dispute and discussion when the second wave of feminism started in the late 60s and early 70s. Bua had concluded after exploring the historic situation of women that women have been prevented from taking control of their lives. Woman has been the other throughout culture and man has been the self, the subject. Woman has been subjected to man who partly with woman's consent has made her into the negative of himself. Passivity confronting activity, diversity that destroys unity, matter as opposed to form, disorder against order. Boer had written in 1949 that for the first time in history through the availability of contraceptives and access to paid work, women have started to have a chance to develop into a self as well. The second sex can also be read as a passionate appeal to women to take this chance. Twenty years after the appearance of this book, it was discovered by the new feminist movement. This movement focused on the liberation of female sexuality and on socio-economic autonomy for women. Its most influential works were by Betty Friedan, Kate Millett and Firestone, all of whom admitted in the case of Millet and Friedan only many years later that Boas works started them on the road. In the ethics of ambiguity, Bua has advocated living as a unity of body and consciousness. Her philosophical framework in this respect is the phenomenological perspective that approaches humans as situated and incarnated beings or living bodies. She argues that the human condition is ambiguous we are both empty consciousness and incarnated beings. The ambiguous elements of our human condition are not merely set along, alongside each other, but are placed in a specific hierarchical order. She wanted women to become selves, but in contrast to Sartre, it is a situated sensitive self she has pursued for women and also for men. Identity is much criticized in postmodern feminist thinking. During the 1970s, feminist theory emphasized either equality or difference. During the 80s, a different perspective emerged in this context. Postmodern thinkers such as Derrida or Foucault have attacked the supposed unity of the subject and have formulated the need for an escape from the restrictions of the fixed unitary self. Other forms of subjectivity have to be developed that no longer imprison us in a restrictive identity. Feminist theoreticians such as Judith Butler and Rosie Bredotti, two philosophers whom we shall discuss in complete detail, elaborate on this view with respect to the feminine subject. There is a need to unravel and deconstruct fixed meanings of womanhood so that an open space is created to permit the shaping of new ways of thinking and living. Postmodern feminism with its suspicion of an essential subject woman expresses the political mood of the feminist movement today and has also influenced our understanding of the term gender in today's concept. In today's context, Boas concept of the self prefigures and anticipates the postmodern and multiculturalist critique on the essential autonomous self. For this, we will again turn to her thinking on ethics. Seeing our human condition as ambiguous, Bua, in opposition to abstract moral theory, has introduced ethics of ambiguity. Our ambiguous condition, especially our element of separatedness, 
is the reason why universal positive moral laws cannot exist for in the end we can never speak for another person. However, the concrete existence of the situated human being can certainly be the locus of an ethical dimension. In the ethics of ambiguity, ethics comes forward as an attitude of willing oneself free, which comes down to constantly freely shaping oneself into a specific subject in the world by taking responsibility for individual specific values. She also says that by willing ourselves free, we commit ourselves to freedom as such and therefore to the freedom of everyone. People can lack every chance to shape themselves as ethical subjects and we have to intervene into power relations that impede them to do so and this politics immediately comes into the picture. Her emphasis on ethics as an art of living or as a whole way of life once more underlines that her concept of the self is not the western Cartesian pre-given self that is externally related to its body and to the world, but a sensitive self embedded in context, a unity of head, heart and soul. In conclusion, Bua's thinking already contains some crucial elements for such a global feminism. She also combined theory with activism. She was one of the first French intellectuals who opposed the French wars in Vietnam and Algeria. Her discussions started the conversation on the difference between sex and gender. The early works we discussed in this module provide the psychological corollaries to the philosophical discussions which are presented in the second sex, Bua's magnum opus, which we shall discuss in the next module. Thank you.